Good afternoon. I would like to greet everybody. So this is discussion of the Ukrainian Book Institute on the Frankfurt Book Fair. Uh, Regarding the topic of the Ukrainian literature as a part of the European civilization, the formation of the external canon of Ukrainian literature and its translation to foreign languages, we fully understand that this is an extremely interesting topic to discuss, and this kind of practical issue, it has a huge practical part of it, part of this issue. This is a talk about which texts of the Ukrainian literature more older ones and which are closer to the modern times or even modern might be interesting and might be used in order to expand the knowledge about the Ukrainian literature all over the world. So this is kind of expert canon, such as the least of the obligatory texts. We're not going to list all of them, but we would like to start this discussion. And it would be really great that the Ukrainian Book Institute in this framework of the Frankfurt book market has initiated this discussion. I would like to present our speakers today. We have great speakers actually today with us. There's Rihori Hrabovich, professor of the Ukrainian literature department of the Ukrainian Institute of the Harvard University, also the founder of Critic Literature and who has a huge knowledge of Gadi Nishevchenko, the person who is actually changing the canon inside the Ukraine. He also the author of other books. That's also Tamara Gundro, who is also with us, PhD in uh, linguistics, who is the head of the Department of Linguistics of the Taras Shchenko University, National Academy of Sciences, member of National Academy of Sciences of Ukraine, and also the author of academic books, Franco about Franco, also about the Chernobyl catastrophe. That's also Oksana Pachlovska, who is PhD professor of the Rome Univers University, awarded by the Teres Shevchenko National Award for the book Our Europe. That's also Vasil Mahno, poet, interpreter, the leading scientific worker of the Teres Shevchenko community in New York. Also, the author of Internal Calendar, also of a huge amount of the works and knowledge of the 16th, which is also extremely important in our modern context. And also, we have Elena Haleta, who is also with us, who is PhD in linguistics, professor of theory of literature and comparison literature, department of Lviv National University, and also the head of the Catholic University. My name is Jaroslav Semkiv, and I'm going to conduct this discussion as the moderator. We do not have a lot of time, and we have actually a huge topic to discuss, a really powerful topic to discuss. It's not even to have the list of those, of those texts which might be proposed, but we need to approach this, and we need to form the general principles, so the most common principles, based on which we need to implement this kind of discussion. Of course, it requires a separate mechanisms, but it's always extremely pleasant for me to think that starting from this discussion, we might initiate some kind of step-by-step -step approach, because we do really observe that this change, reformation of the Ukrainian canon of the Ukrainian literature in the 90s, it moves a little bit chaotically. And it is extremely too interesting to make it in order or at least to set some kind of the important lines in order to set it correctly. I would like to unite those two questions and everybody would have the possibility to give their own opinion on that. And later we might move to other topics as well. And this is the first thing that I would like to discuss. What are the main principles which should be the basis or the background in the formation of this Ukrainian canon, so external canon? I'm on the list of the texts which might be interesting in European literature or in worldwide literature or European readers or for institutions which have Ukrainian literature. 
whether it's an aesthetic principle or an ideological principle, or that's the principle of being actual, which is more closer to our time. What kind of texts? That's from one side. From another side, we still need to talk about personalities. And in this case scenario, when I was getting prepared for this discussion, I was really surprised personally, maybe obvious since fathers, in case we have an agreement regarding the names of the Ukrainian canon, in case Ukrainian literature of the 90s, start of the 20th centuries, this well-known triad of Taras Shevchenko, Ivan Franko, and Lysa Ukrainka, or maybe right now Lysa Ukrainka and Taras Shevchenko and Ivan Franko, we have this kind of general agreement. But around the 20th century, we have some kind of different opinions around that. We have different views who might be those who represent Ukrainian literature in order for in academic society also in academic society also to agree with that and also in the society of schools or those who practically deliver and educate the pupils also in the universities and also just simple readers maybe it's just Vasily Stus or maybe there are others that we need to mention so I would like to give the first flow to Mr. Grigory Grabovich so please giving you the flow yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks for this possibility to give a talk and to discuss this topic with my colleagues, with those who really know Ukrainian language and with this wider audience as well. I would say the following. So first of all, we need to understand that this external canon, in case we are going to talk about it, in case we have this kind of concept, we do not have influence on it, first of all. It is done on its own principles and laws. So first of all, there's a market laws. And also they are stochastic, as we say. So they're chaotic. What's well, interesting? But the quality plays a huge role. Maybe it's even the first role and the most important one. But we have different approaches to that, which we cannot accept. In case of the talk about the 19th century, century it's terror incognita, we do not know it, and the Western part, they do not know about it, and they do not pay that much attention. And also those translations which exist, in case we talk about the English language, maybe in different cultures it's different, but those translations that we have on Taras Shevchenko, they are really bad. They are just like parodies. They are not adequate. Franco, the same way around. Those translations of Lesio Krinka, the same way around. Maybe there are some good scenes, but they are as a marginal, or we do not have a lot of them, that they do not influence the presence of those personalities in the Western part of the world. In case we talk about the 20th century and the 21st century, we have a different picture, completely opposite one, and we are going to talk about that as well, I think. And those authors that are translated right now, Yuri Andruhovich, Izdrek, Oksana Zabushko, Jadan. Maybe, first of all, we have the most translations of them. All of those personalities are interesting. We need to know them. We need to discuss about them. Whether do we have an influence, how do we present them, or how do we promote them, or how do we lobby them? That's another question. Each culture, they have their own leverages. And Everybody would like, I would like to hear how it looks like in different kind of English speaking societies, but that's how it works. And I would like to say one small thing, because I do not want to talk that one. I think that this is an extremely important question because of the presence of good translations and existing of this kind of external canon, as far as it is mentioned before, it influenced the whole discipline. So it just getting alive. Right now, we may deliver the course of Ukrainian literature, which is dealing with the 20th century. And the closer we get to our days, the more we can talk about good authors, because we do have translations, but we don't have good translations of Khvilovoy. Right now, we just have a book of William Blacker, The Travel to Dr. Leonard. 100 years after that, just imagine. So we have great basis but we still have this kind of huge gap of stalinism and soviet union or soviet union provin province of the ukrainian literature but we have a huge potential and this potential gives us the possibility to somehow study 
promote and to discuss it even among our Ukrainian readers. Thanks a lot, Mr. Grigori. Thanks a lot. And thanks a lot for putting this breach in order for also to us to investigate not only from the Ukrainian point of view. That's why I'm going to give a flow to Pani Oksana Pachlovska. So, this process of Ukrainian literature getting into the European context, what's your view on it from your position? Thanks. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Thanks a lot for this question as well. So, first of all, I would like to say that we need to agree on the further steps of this discussion and on some kind of material platform, for example, in magazines or in newsletters, we need to have this discussion there because that's a huge issue. And this issue is extremely important for Ukraine. Ukraine is starting to get into the Europe, but Ukraine has been doing that for 30 years. We already have some studies which prove that Ukrainian literature is part of the European literature, but we do not have that in some kind of real equivalent because there are no translations and there are not the amount of authors. All of that does not correspond to the ambitions of the Ukraine to become a, Euro to become a European country. And that's culture, that's literature, which should be represented by that communicative wave which recipient might understand that. And this is where we from the English-speaking community moves to the European community, European continental, so to say, audience. And this is where we change the horizon. I would like not to agree with the question, with the following form of the question that the choice of authors should be dictated by market interest, external interest, not market, not external, any kind of approaches would form. Our proposal, our understanding of our literacy and our perspectives for the future would form that. Just a really clear example, in Italian schools, Children, when they are 14, 15, they are studying external canon. These are two huge books which start from Homer and finalize with the modern literature. They start from antique literature. And I would like to say that our market would not actually have, would, would not say, and would not tell a big interest into Homer. But that's the value which is widely accepted, aesthetic, ideological one, and the most important, that's a philosophical value of some of the writings some of the pieces of writing that's why i think that those previous opinions those previous previous discussions of those questions with uh, Insti ukrainian Insti book institute i think that we have a nice possibility and we have a nice way of taking advantage there are a lot of books which are written which are named European history of the Italian literature, European history of the French literature, European history of English literature. So there is something that does not, is not needed to be proven, but still at the same time, we have the need to write down the European history of those cultures. Why? Because there are huge paradigms, philosophical paradigms, which talk about the freedom, about the terms of individuality, multicultural, approaches dialogues so all of that actually is the part of the european philosophical idea or opinion which is the basis horizon ideological horizon in case you would like to name it so of the europe of europe that's why i would like to say that this is extremely important question for the Ukrainian literature and this external canon or European canon, let's start from this point of view, it has to be developed inside Ukraine because that's where Ukraine understands the value of its own authors, writings, and independently whether they're going to be an external market or internal one, it doesn't matter how exactly what the recipient is going to be, who is going to be the recipient, whether we are going to have more or less of that recipient. That's a secondary question. And any kind of translations of the Ukrainian literature, that's first of all the university societies and university environment. And that's part of the linguistics 
were still further Russian language takes a lot of and a lot of paradigms of Russian language. That's why we need to take into account that we have the golden understanding of each culture and we need to use this golden reserve and we need to represent this golden reserve. And in case this writing is not going to be read today or tomorrow, further on, the scientists are going to continue the interpreting of that writing during the timeline. And the last point which I would like to mention, yes, with interpreting, with uh, translation, that's a complete catastrophe. We are the 30 years of independence and there is nobody who would care about it. We are conducting that in each us of our scientific environment, but that's not enough. We need to have a communication way, a system of communication, of cooperation between those young Ukrainian specialists which we form in the foreign universities and those Ukrainians who are studying of foreign languages inside Ukraine because we have quite a lot of people who know languages quite good but they do not know how to use those languages for translation that's why we need to work with that because we need to work with all of them and we talk about four basic languages in this context for this Western promotion on the Western part. That's English, French, German, and Italian. These are four languages of those cultures which founded Europe, which were the basis for the South and also North of the Europe. So German code of Europe. That's why I would say that's the question which is needed to be highlighted and which is the primary question, the quality of translation. Thanks a lot, Oksana. We hope that the changes, they are going to happen. The whole this discussion should be the initial point of work and the initial way of invest, investment of the Ukrainian book institute and this is what actually gives us hope tamara i would like to address a flow to you and also to add another question the question for those for that person who knows ukrainian situation internally so the creation of canons and changes of those canons so that's an additional question or effect could we have enough optimism in the case we talk about the new Ukrainian institutions and even those updated Ukrainian institutions that they have enough power not just to build up internally the cultural field but also to work externally? Yes, giving you the floor, Tamara. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for this question. Also extremely happy to participate in this discussion. I think that this is an extremely important and nice topic to discuss. So, by answering your question, I would like to start with talking about the Western canon. So, the Ukrainian literature, as far as we know, there is no place there. And it is also true for a lot of other cultures. So, when we talk about approaching and getting into this new orbit, in case we are getting the, the Ukrainian literature as the participant of this process, we need to think about those complicated questions that we ask in order to update, to reform, or to become the part of that Western canon. And that is an extremely ambitious aim or goal, as I, as I would say. And this is a goal not just to talk about the criteria or the list of the authors, but that's a really complex question, which should cover, in fact, and take into account all of those agents of this cultural field that's in fact to understand that we are getting into the modern world and the same way around the modern book world and this cotton that's a market and this is where i'm going to support the idea of professor grabovich and it is extremely important the players on this field that's extremely important that's authors that's the audience readers those who this literature should target criteria is how we choose the writings, those agencies which work with promotions, because without that it would be really complicated. Interpreters and translators, who are those translators? 
which translate texts into Ukrainian at the moment that deliver those texts. In most of the cases, that's academic professors or academic scientists, which besides their educational work, they also translators. So all of those aspects, they are extremely important. And when we talk about them, and when we talk about this external expert canon, we need to understand whether this question is a really complex one. That's the first question. The second one is the question about for whom do we write it? For whom we create this canon and for whom we prescribe it? And I think that it's rather obvious right now that we need to consciously understand that at least two of those types of readers might be mentioned. The first type are just those who are interested in the literature. So to say actual literature, as it was mentioned by Rostislav, the literature which is interesting, high quality literature. And from the political ideological point of view, it is also important. Let's just talk about that Stanislav Asiev's translations, which are really resonant and needed in the modern world. And all of the writers which were mentioned before, we might enlarge that list. Also, I have checked one website, and there was a list of authors who are translated the most. And that list is rather good, I would say. Sofia Andruhovic, Jadan, Zavushko, Repchuk, Katrina Kalitko, Karitantina Babkina, Andriy Kurko, Andriy Lopko, Vladimir Rafayenko, Vladimir Remchuk, and also others. But what did they pay attention to? In fact, that twist, it's rather limited still. And in case we talk about the translations, we need also to see, so to say, a map of interest. Of course, those translations are in the eastern and central part of Europe. Of course, there is a huge interest, and they have a rather higher level of knowledge about the Ukrainian literature comparing to the United States or comparing to other contents, other parts of the world. So that's also extremely important. I also know that the Ukrainian Book Institute conduct really important work. They provide catalogs of Ukrainian texts, which are going to be used by foreign leaders and which are used in different kind of markets, book markets, and those kind of catalogs, they're distributed. This is extremely important, and that's a great practice, where, in fact, those kind of English-speaking catalogs, as far as I know, they're English-speaking, they're in, in English, I'm not sure about other languages, but we might at least see the new published books and annotations, which we might use further to conduct translations. So that's the category of, so to say, actual canon, actual literature, so to say. And this is where we have our own fashion, fashion on different kind of genres and different kind of topics. So there are some factors and we cannot be that idealistic that everybody is going to read what Ukrainian authors write about. They're going to read it when it's going to be interesting for them. And the second type, of that canon readers or the second type of that literature is where we talk about some kind of academic literature this is an academic question about putting our classics into the worldwide context i think that in general all over the world the interest to classics not only to ukrainian one but in general is not that big maybe different ways of reinterpretation different kind of films, for example. So that's a productive way, of course. But classics, it's not reread that often with that kind of love and interest. So by saying that, and by mentioning that those kind of texts, that's actually the literature of the 15th century. Not only Shevchenko, Wesley Ukrinka. We do not have a good translations of Wesley Ukrinka as well. And it was shown actually and other authors as well. This is where we talk about the 20th century, the 20s. Khvilovy, Pidmohilny, Johansson, Kulish, and others. 
So I think that this work, this is where we should have a targeted approach. I would dream about some kind of a huge project which would give us the possibility to start together with Pius or with Harvard University, which would allow us to start this translation series of in English of Ukrainian classics. Because we need to understand that that's a huge goal and not everybody would be able to fulfill that goal. And we also need to understand that those things are, first of all, targeted in order to develop Ukrainian with Ukrainian language, professors, students, different kind of cooperative studies which are needed to be performed and need to become a part of this process. And in case we talk about also the promotion of this literature in the Western part of the Europe, we need to have a good follow-up as well. So the good interpreting approach. So not to provide just texts, but also to provide some kind of stories, literature stories, so the follow-up for the texts for that kind of literature. And I also think that, in fact, the quite perspective way of this canon creation of these classics might be the different kind of anthologies, publications during some kind of period or some kind of type of literature, which actually covers the whole story of literature. So we need to be idealists from one point of view, and we need to be really pragmatic, because we are going to understand that we are on the market which is full of competitors, and we need to search for those possibilities where we might get into this external canon and how we might get the Ukrainian literature in that external part. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Tamara. And please, Vasil, Vasil Makhno, I would like to ask you somehow to compare, because Vasil was actually working in Ukraine, and for quite a long time, he is in New York. And please, Vasil, going to ask you how this issue appears. How does this issue appear in case we're going to compare external and internal question in Ukraine and outside Ukraine? Could we actually predict or could we actually feel that there is an interest to the Ukrainian literature or whether this interest is going to emerge? I'm asking that as well because Vasil is the participant of a huge amount of festivals and he is a poet who is translated rather actively in different kind of languages. So what's your vision of this issue? Thanks a lot, Rostislav. Thanks a lot for the invitation to participate in this discussion. That's an extremely important discussion and extremely interesting. I think that we are just on the initial stages of forming of those Canaan principles of the Ukrainian literature. To talk about canon, it's it's so to say the first initial step to understand the Ukrainian literature and in general Ukrainian idea, the national idea of Ukraine, regarding the point that we want to get into this European process, the general European process. And this is also extremely important because it takes us away from some kind of Russian or Soviet Union canon, which existed previously. And Ukrainian literature of the Soviet Union time, it was aimed towards eastern part of the world, not the western one. But of course there were some translations there, but we do understand that. For me it is extremely important that, and interesting is that, maybe I'm going to give an, a little bit erratic approach, but I will explain. I think that our Ukrainian literature is small literature, belongs to small literature. And some time ago I was in India on this kind of market, and I have found out that there are 38,000 people who are speaking Malaya, and that Malaya language is used to write down and to create literature. So this is small literature. It's not about the amount of authors. It's not about the genres which were developed, styles which were developed. It's not about our classics. But that's about the supporting the idea or opinion that the general mass 
that most of the literature is created in English, French, Spanish languages, in English languages. And it is understandable that each of the literatures, Albanian, Slovakian, Polish, all of those representatives of those literatures, they want to get into this mainstream, so to say, so to be translated and the writings in order for with all of those languages to be translated, in order the discussion to be happening around those small literatures or about some authors as the representatives of those small literatures. That's why for me it is extremely interesting that today we are on the initial part of formation of this canon of this discussion and also the process in general and the initial stage of that process and that initial process is extremely complicated because one way in case we are going to define it for internal use and we are going to show it externally that's so to say our issue the other problem is in case that canon is going to be accepted by external publication houses or external readers and also foreign intellectuals bloom for example he did not even include the literature in those kind of canons. We might say that Bloom was not informed enough or was not aware about the parts of the Europe, but at the same time, that's some kind of warning for us or a challenge for us personally, or a challenge for our literature and culture. The other way around, I would like to say that translations, and this is where I'm going to agree with mentioned around and mentioned earlier opinion that Ukrainian literature is presented in the Central Europe in the best way around, probably in Germany. It's worse represented in UK, even worse represented in the United States. And talking about Australia, I'm, I'm not going to mention that, or for example, New Zealand. But that's not the talk about, that's where we are making a little fun of it. Of course, all of those achievements that we do have, they're extremely important. In the United States, not a long period of time ago, in such academic publishers, publications such as Academic Press, that's the name, Academic Press, there are some translations of Bajan, early Bajan. And that's achievement, I would say, that there is Bajan. I think that Bajan has never been translated into English. Maybe it was translated, but it was not fixated anywhere, it was not mentioned anywhere. And there are quite a lot of translations. And we'll see, you may see that Professor shows that book over there. But I think that Hori is going to agree with me as well that all of those translations, which are in the, in the same book, they are not equal. Not all of them are equal. Of course, they're individual approach of each translator, but still. The other way around, we are not taking into account one thing our Ukrainian literature and this whole 19, the start of the 20th century, 60s, we are excluding some names. I'm just going to ask those questions. Why we have Vasil Stos in that question, but why don't we have Rory Tutunnik? Why there is, why there is no great talk great writing by Fyodor Sirogovi. Why there is no Fyodor Sirogovi in this discussion, which is exactly the writing about this food in that village. And those questions that are arising, they are rather similar. Why this Russian author was resonating and was being able to tra be translated, but why with Rohovoi we do not have that? And these are just some questions, these are just some examples. But we are not much attention paying today, I would say, when we do have a huge amount of examples. And I think that in this sense, in this context, the modern world, it changes rapidly. Everything is done in a really accelerated way fashion changes, trends are changing, how it is beloved to be said. And we, according to my opinion, we are getting into this train, civilization train, and we are jumping into the last part of that train. 
because all other European nations, they have their own canon, they have everything. And we still would like to get away from this eastern part from Russia, and we try to present our classics or our modern literature in this kind of rather strange environment for us. We, and that environment is rather ironic, or rather sarcastic, and that environment does not want to accept some kind of new fits from some kind of a pure part of the Europe, and where it's not clear at all about that. And that's why I think that when we would really talk about those things, we are going to discuss those things, when we would have different kind of institutions which are going to support us. I'm going to say another thing. There is an institution of Ukrainian book, Ukrainian Book Institute, but in the United States they have a huge program of Austrian and German literature to be translated, and this is financed by government, and there are some contracts with certain public publisher houses and also with some translators, and that's a governmental process which is happening, because all of that is sporadic right now. There are some translators, they do appear, they translate some of the authors, they have some contracts with publishing houses, but we do not have a national program, a map, which would show our deep interest and our care about the Ukrainian literature in its own canon externally, I do not see that map. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Vasil. And I would like to ask you another small question, which is also in the context about the anthology. So whether did you, did you have a feeling that the canon was creating, was created? It is rather hard to, to mention one person or another one. That's hard to take the responsibility for. And Tamara is going to participate in that discussion as far as this. Rostislav, I'm just going to give my answer shortly. This anthology was formed when I was really young, and I thought that I might create that canon. canon. When I observe it right now, from this point of time, I think that the active, there are like five or four active writers. All others, they have changed their sphere, or they just stopped writing. That anthology, for me, that's just a fixation and some aesthetics on that transition period of time from Soviet Union to independent Ukraine. That's why I would like to say that I would like to observe it without huge amount of interest, without huge amount of emerging interest. But in this context of text, I would like to say that someone should take that responsibility, and this is extremely important, and that coordinates representatives of different communities, Jan Wine, different kind of ontologies, they appear. But I fully understand the process and the complexity of this process. We also have a look, for example, who was creating this young Ukrainian poetry was creating a couple of years ago. He also faced the same issues, that some people were not included, others were included. And I would like to give a floor to Olena right now. So, Olena, we have started this talk about some direct mechanisms of creation of canon. So, as a person who was investigating ontology in her monography, what would you say? whether those tools are effective and whether we might move right now by using this way. So Tamara has already mentioned new books from Ukraine. That's not an anthology, but these are some catalogs which are created by the Ukrainian Book Institute. And anyway around, they create the possibility to understand the situation and for the publisher houses to see the names but those intelligence that would be much more effective. Would you agree? Yeah, thanks for the invitation to participate in this talk. I think that this talk might be a step towards good changes in the representation of the Ukrainian literature outside the Ukraine. As a teacher who is also educating Ukrainian literature to the foreign language audiences, I think that's rather complicated when you might have those 
those discussions with some kind of complicated text, and the translations are rather different and have different quality. In the case, it's not a story, lectures, and that's some kind of thematical topic, that's extremely hard discussion to conduct. But Ukrainian literature on the translation market, that's, the situation is not that hopeless. I was investigating the index of UNESCO, but their website right now is index of translations at UNESCO website, but that website is getting changed right now. So I would like to give another statistics. The data of authors, so Ukrainian authors who were published in the United States starting from 2018 to 2021, the Ukraine is in the place between the 30 and 40, 10, between the 30 and 40. So we might say it's good or not that good position. Of course, we would like to move into the top 10, but another way around from Ukraine, there are more than 100 countries after us. So we have some basis, but we still have a huge amount of work to get done. But there is this opinion already that we are the situation we are trying to get, that we need to do something extra because we have some depth in this history. And maybe it's not the most productive position. And maybe it's not that good to describe our position that way around. I would not like that talk to sound anachromic. And I have some doubts in regarding the intellectual respectability of canon term. That term was actually created during the 19th century and in the end of the 20th century there was a huge amount of discussions about the content of canon, also the, that western part of canon, but also around the term itself. Why? Because when we use this term, we need to discuss a lot of things. The first associations, these are some associations with prescriptions, so to say. So I'm going to talk about the formulation about those mechanisms which do change the way of thinking and which do change the way of communication. Regarding etymology, I'm going to say a couple of words, but I would like also to remind about the lists which were not just used to inform, but also used to motivate potential translators and potential publishing houses to work with certain authors and to work with certain writings, just to conduct the translation and searching for the audience to read. Those kind of lists, they should not be limited. I think this is extremely important, that those lists are not hierarchic, and they need to have annotations which would increase the entry points towards this topic. In case we propose the list, the canon of Ukrainian literature, the national literature, we need to understand that we are getting our audience narrower for those who are just interested in the Ukrainian literature. But in case those annotations allow us, for example, to find interesting texts for researchers who are investigating avant-garde or who are interested in the female writing, then we would expand the field of choice and we would allow Ukrainian texts and Ukrainian authors to get involved into different kind of contexts, to be interested in different kind of topics. And I think that the huge Huge work regarding that was started by the Ukrainian ben, during the last three years when they were working during two of those lists. That's 100 remarkable writings of Ukrainian publications and 100 remarkable novels from Patelemon Kulish, 19th century up to today, and the previous list from Fihori Skovroda to modern days. Those lists, they are not created right now and forever. It's extremely important to understand how and who exactly creates those lists, who and how create them, and those lists, they are variable. They do create and they do open that field of choice for us. Regarding anthologies, each anthology, each anthology, that's a great catalog, that's a great co collection, which does not just give us information about separate authors and texts, but that's also what gives us the possibility to translate some common senses and some values 
to say about some certain values. So this is the point where I understand that this Ukrainian talk sounds one way around, but in the English translation, it is going to deliver other associations, because in Ukrainian contest and tologies, they were not crystal minded. They were not those according to which pupils or students in the universities were studied. These were always those which were representative alternatives, which were representative possibilities, those which were given the most actual request. But in my understanding, the modern literature is not just modern literature. For our right now, for us right now, Lesser Krinka is actual, or Shevchenko, or some texts of Shevchenko are actual right now. But I think that anthologies, they really help to create the context of separate writings to explain why it is not important that they were written at some moment, but it is also important to understand why we need to continue to read them today. And for us ontologies, for me personal ontologies, they are extremely important. They, they do not just provide information, but they provide access to pieces or to writings. Ontologies, they create interest. They encourage, they encourage the potential translators or teachers to find resources in order to support those kind of translations. And I think that when we talk about the representation of the Ukrainian literature today with different kind of languages, it is extremely important for us also to understand the context in which they should be discussed. European market and the word market is exactly the term that we need to use. We might imagine it the following way around. We might see them through diversity reports. Right now we have diversity reports of 2020, this kind of document in which there is an information about translations in Europe, in different languages, in different genres, in different topics, and so on. And we need to remember about that. In case we talk about the canon, then the general topic should be happening around the cultural diversity term. And we need somehow also to know to com how to combine those languages. And one more thing which I would like to say about this report, despite the general statistics which gives us the information, these are those trends are popular, these are those things they have chances in order to get to the reader because they are expected, but also a lot of case studies in these reports. So those case studies which have a lot of attention. And this are other interesting things. For example, web comics is different kind of adaptation of those topics and writings. And we need to think about those exceptions as well. Those exceptions that not always, but always have, but not always, but have the chances to get some attention. Thanks, thanks a lot, Elena. And dear colleagues, we just have small amount of time, but maybe they have some possibility or they have some wish to react. Please. Yes, rather shorter, because we really do have just 12 minutes, and there are still six people that I'd like to talk, or five. But still, a couple of things. First thing, that canon, we need somehow to imagine it, to, to understand. That's a discussion. This is a talk, which is internal for each culture and has different value. And it's also marginal, because the world is changing, and that canon which was discussed previously, as uh, Harold Bloom has actually written the Western canon, it might be inadequate from our perspective. And that's it. So that's his approach to canonize those authors that he knows and he loves. Shakespeare, first of all. But he knows just Tolstoy and Dostoevsky from the Russian-speaking world. And bubble, and bubble. Okay, good. Yes, agree. But why bubble should be more important than Dovzhenko or than Johansson? It is not mentioned in any way around. That's not something that I'd like to talk about. These are just the things we need to fight. These are windmills, and we are donkey. We are not Don Quixotes to fight with windmills. Let's talk about the other process. I'd like to give you a quote of Shevchenko. Money break walls. 
This is what is mentioned in Haidamaki, but that's true. In case there is an investment, not in auto parks, but in the translation services, then we might do it. But the government was not caring about it. Ukraine was incorporated. That's the point. So it was, in case it would be Russia, they would invest it, and they are doing the investments. Just imagine, Russian literature is that powerful and is dominating in the Western part, around the whole globe. And they still invest billions, billions of rubles, but still billions, in order to promote, constantly promote translation of the Russian literature, which is rather translated, basically, whole. But Ukraine, no. So in case there are investments, in case there are people, the things might be done. And also it is extremely important to have an internal canon and then to talk about the external one. In case you do not have an internal resources and internal approaches which are shared, then we are fighting the windmills. Thanks. Tamaro, you wanted to mention something? No, no, actually I also wanted to say that Yes, in fact, in case we talk, when we talk about the canon, can, in case we talk about canon, we are talking about the constant change. And even those Swiss which were created, in the creation of which I was involved, those Swiss for which were voted, which were voted, there are quite a lot of things which I could not agree with or which I would understand. So yes, Swiss are also some kind of canons as well in those community of people which were creating them. But I think that it is extremely important to understand that we have two types of readers. The first type, that's the university students, scientists, researchers, which are going to read and find what they need for their lectures, for their seminars, for their workshops, for their studies. And the other type, which we might still involve, this is just ordinary readers which get the book and read it we need to really know about that i know that in germany after after a translation of andruhovich there was an inter emerging interest of antonich so we really need to give those hooks which would allow to hook the people up and for them to move the past of ukrainian literature and this is extremely important we do not have this genre of good biographies non-fiction biographies about our authors, which give such a huge material in order to be, in order to become the heroes of separate stories. And that's also that form of promotion of our Ukrainian literature in the world. And that's what we also need to have internally, which was not used previously. And anyway around, I think that this discussion, we still need to continue that and this would help Oksana, please. Nominally, I agree that canon, this is a discussion, and canon, that's just amount of values. And those values, which culture represents its own, on its own. Boom was mentioned. I would like also to say about Kundra, the Czech writer has has mentioned that it is undifferentiated Russian space. And that's just a really awful vision. And right now, when we have the possibility to talk about the European canon, please do remember that we are on the crossroads. We are on the crossroads of that division of borders, what we call Emirates of Europe. Europe. That's a huge rupture between two Romanian imperies, and we are located on the rupture line. And in case through our literature we are not going to explain that to Europe, we have nothing to do in Europe. It was mentioned also before about... I would, it was also mentioned to something before which I do not agree. We could not orient on the UK, France, or Germany in our vision. Europe consists out of huge amount of nations and it works according to the equality on the, on the Europe parliament. It's written that in Bulgarian, first of all, 
So we need to understand kind of promotion exists in Poland, in Czech Republic, Scandinavian countries. For example, Scandinavian countries created a publishing house in Italy, which publishes just Scandinavian literature. And during that publishing house, the Scandinavian literature is getting more attention. And one extremely thing which is also important to mention, the scientific and university environment and readers. Of course, readers, they might do have different kind of interests. The interest not only from aesthetic point of view or political point of view or any kind of other interests, but that's a question about the sophistics. That's a really important question because we need to continue to to get this literature as the continuum event. But we do not have that because the ancient Ukrainian literature is not interested for the reader. They're just using the Russian scheme, so to say. So we started with some kind of Kotlarevsky, which could not be translated. And then what's next? That's why this division, methodological division, it is extremely important. And also one more element which is needed to be mentioned in the Ukrainian literature. Poetry is much more powerful because it is known those other nations, they have the other way around. But right now in Europe, the interest to the literature is getting less attention and the translation of poetry is getting less attention. So what does it mean? We need to stop present our poetry or what? That's why we need to work on those really complicated challenges of literature, aesthetic, or any kind of other challenges, and not waiting the response which would be at that concrete moment, because in a general feeling of literature, that's great. And all of us have a huge enthusiasm, a huge enthusiastic approach to Andruhovich translation, for example. And these also are the bridges which are important to understand the Ukraine. But in case we have that and we do not have Hvalevi Kotsubinsky, how we are going to prove the continuity, con continuum of Ukrainian literature? And then it all gets into the case studies or separate niche of interest. Anthologies with anthologists, I do agree that they're extremely important, but anthologists, they are not beloved everywhere. In Europe, they do not love it, but that's an important way of, an important tool of presentation. That's where I would like to mention that as well. This is where I would like also to think about those anthologies of not a huge amount of authors, not a huge amount of writers, authors, but just according to some topic. Thanks, thanks. We just do not have a lot of time. We just have like a couple of minutes left. But, Olena, would you like to defend ontologies? I don't think that ontologies are needed to be defended. They are as flexible in order to react to modern situation. Right now, I think that, in fact, we really have some kind of mechanism of action. In this situation, we have the possibility to change something and to do something for the presentation of the Ukrainian literature. I would not like to talk about the criteria. So I'm not ready to do that. But I was thinking, what's my main goal? So I would name my goal this way around Ukrainian literature literature as the part of the European tradition of literature, but that part without which the European literature would not be full, then it might be interesting for the foreign readers, but we have a long way to get there. And there are quite a lot of efforts which are needed in order to do it. And Vasil, please finalize it by the word of a poet. I think that by listening to all of those opinions of my colleagues, that's really a deep topic which we start to understand. But it would be also interesting to listen to other side, maybe some kind of Western recipient, academic recipient from academic environment, from publishing houses, or just readers in order somehow to understand what does Western world want from us in order for them to include us. I understand that right now it is done in different kind of publications, in different kind of journals, but that's rather narrow circle. 
that's just for academic environment but still literature which represents the country it should in fact be a plane which is moving on the ultrasound speed and which would move towards the wider circle of readers and this is how the literature became the player on the becomes the player on the foreign field thanks a lot i'm going to summarize quite a lot of opinions were mentioned during today which are interesting to develop which might have some kind of polemic potential that's why i hope and i would like to thank you to the ukrainian book institute which have organized this discussion in order for this to continue on one of the platforms and really to get into contextual approach and this discussion would develop the interaction which would be happening in order for discussions to continue and for this just to be the start of this fruitful conversation which would give the possibility in fact really to move from theory to the practical part and also to move towards solving the problem thanks a lot to everybody and all the best take care bye all the best perspectives thank you thank you bye